So, thank you for joining me today. I am here to tell you a little bit about what I do and why I do it. And I'm going to start with telling you a little bit about my background in the sense I'm a political scientist. And as a political scientist, one of the things I'm very interested in is how is it that ideas, interests, and institutions come together? I'm going to talk about ideas, narratives is another way we can say that, institutions, those are things like governmental bodies and political parties, and then we also have interests that are behind them, the power and, and the things that you want to achieve. So I'm actually a climate scientist, but I look at climate from a political science perspective. And when I was still a graduate student and I was looking for a dissertation topic, I'm getting old, it was the Montreal Protocol times, back in the late 1980s. And I was watching what was going on. The world was getting very, very concerned about the emergence of an ozone hole. A hole in the stratospheric ozone layer, it's actually not a hole, it's just a thinning of stratospheric ozone. But it was causing a lot of concern that we were going to have ultraviolet radiation that would cause all kinds of human health problems. Um, skin cancer, cataracts, also very bad for nature because it impacts DNA. So one of the things that was amazing about the Montreal Protocol is that it brought the world together. It brought all of the nations of the world together to say, this is a problem we have to work on. It's a problem we have to solve. And they found solutions. The solutions involved changing industrial activities, stopping using chlorofluorocarbons that we used in refrigerators, air conditioners, fire hydrants, and switching to other chemicals. It also involved sort of compromise between the northern countries and the southern countries, and the northern countries providing financial and technical assistance to the developing countries. So as I was looking for my own dissertation topic, global warming, that's what we called it back then, global warming was just starting to emerge as a topic of interest. And I thought, I think I want to work on this topic. And I can tell you, I picked the right topic. I have devoted my life to thinking about climate change from a political perspective, because it's at the political level that the framework for what we do is established. But I'm also somebody who loves international exchange and, and international cooperation, and I was thinking, what do we need to bring countries together to work on this kind of topic? And so I decided that I was going to focus my attention on the biggest emitters and to try to understand what is it that, that's actually blocking action? Why is it that we know we have a problem that is even more serious, much more serious, than the Montreal Protocol was, was tackling? In the sense that if we, don't, if we don't do it with climate change, we are going to be facing temperatures that are dangerous to human health, we will see extinction of species, we will see loss of land from rising sea levels, we're already experiencing some of the, the unbearable heat extremes, the droughts, the water shortages. So what is it that's blocking action? And that brings us back to those three I's, ideas, interests, and institutions. You may be here from my accent. I grew up in New York, an American. And the United States, where I grew up, is actually, it's the region of the world that has some of the largest environmental groups, and it has some of the most uh, deep science on climate change. So how is it that the United States has sort of been on a roller coaster when it comes to climate change? You get one administration, Clinton administration, it's science, the Kyoto Protocol. You get to the Bush administration, they say Kyoto Protocol is dead. It's dead because it's hurting American jobs, and it's not fair 
China's not involved. And then you get the Obama administration, and the Obama administration comes in and says, we got to do something. Let's, let's find a new kind of agreement, the Paris Agreement. And the United States helped shape the Paris Agreement. And then we get the Trump administration. The Trump administration pulls the United States out of the Paris Agreement. And now we're with the Biden administration. And the Biden administration says we're back in. So that's kind of a roller coaster, isn't it? We're on, we're off, we're on, we're off. And I was thinking, what's behind that? What causes this kind of, um, we'll call it a negative energy against climate change? And I think a lot of it has to do with the narrative. It's the ideas and how they go through those political institutions that impacts what is dominant in the debate. And if you look at the United States and how in those negative energy times, what we hear is a debate of fear. Fear about the future. Fear that climate change is going to cost jobs, that climate change is going to mean that entire industries are negatively impacted. Fear that the future is not in our hands. But at the same time, we see other actors. Um, let me turn for a minute here to Europe. Isn't it amazing? European Union, of course, it varies a little bit in size, but now 27 member states, that somehow those 27 member states have stuck together through that entire roller coaster that the United States was going on. And they've stuck with the idea that we need multilateral action on climate change. And you can ask, how is that possible? We had Brexit in the meantime. We occasionally see some member states that, that question a little bit the climate science. But nevertheless, the EU has been able to maintain support for this, this very, very serious problem. And I think that too has something to do with the institutions. It's because you have a multilateral system. You have a diverse set of political parties. You have parliamentary systems that allow new ideas to come into those systems a little bit more easily than then that two political party system that the United States has. And if you listen to the narrative, it's a very different narrative. The ideas that are shaping interests are about climate change, not just as a fear factor, but climate change is an opportunity, an opportunity that you need to take into your own hands if you're going to have a good future. An opportunity to invest in new kinds of industries and in that process create a structure that is much more future-oriented. And so in Europe, it's not that you don't have any climate skeptics, but there's been a multi-level reinforcement. Everything from the Fridays for Future movement to uh, particular member states that have championed the idea that Europe's future is a future of renewable energy, a future of green hydrogen, a future of a new kind of mobility, a future of energy efficiency, a future of a circular economy. So we have these different narratives, these different ideas that are out there in the room. But we have to bring in one more player here, and this is China. So I've also looked at China, and China's kind of fascinating in that China, back when the Kyoto Protocol was being negotiated, China was very much seen as a developing country. It was seen as a country that still had to catch up economically. It still needed to invest in developing more energy resources. One of the very interesting things is that China has kind of bought into the narrative of climate change also as something that you need to tackle from an environmental perspective. China is being impacted quite hard by climate change. You have uh, growing desertification, extreme weather events, uh, the high temperatures. But China, in the meantime, has seen that the future is not a future of fossil fuels. 
It's a future of other technologies. It's a future of digitalization, artificial intelligence, a future that's going to mean a whole lot more renewable energy and a whole lot more energy efficiency, as well as a circular economy. So the ideas and the narratives, they've been going back and forth. They've been competing with each other. I think we may be at a turning point. And I think that turning point may be an opportunity for the world to come together more closely. Let's go back to the United States, where we had such a powerful set of climate skeptics. The climate skeptics who were able to convince presidents that climate change was maybe a hoax, or that climate change was something that would hurt the economy if we were to act upon it. And now what you see is that the United States has passed some of the biggest environmental laws focused on climate change in global history. They don't have the name climate in them. It says something also about politics. An infrastructure bill, a bill that is all about bringing green investment to the United States, and an inflation reduction bill, which is an additional push for bringing green hydrogen, electric mobility, and all kinds of energy efficiency investments into the United States. And what happens? We start to see countries moving into competition with each other. The European Union, which for this entire roller coaster ride of the United States, has been pushing the advancement of green energy, that has been pushing the idea of we have to address those CO2 emissions. The European Union can now say, wow, that's terrific. The United States is on board, and look at what China is doing. At the same time, the European Union can say, maybe we also have to see what it takes to keep that green investment here. So the European Union, in the last few years, has passed a green deal to promote all kinds of investment in, in clean energy technologies. At the same time, after the United States passed its new climate legislation, Europe said, we need to come up with a new plan. And just in March of this year, the European Union came out with a Green Deal industrial plan to make it easier to invest in green technologies and clean energy futures, in digitalization, and to keep Europe competitive in the industries of the future. And as somebody who likes to stay optimistic in a field where you can sometimes be kind of pessimistic, I think we may actually be at the stage of what we, what we sometimes in my discipline call trading up. We're entering a phase of competition, which is a kind of positive competition, because we're pushing the standards up. We see that happening in many areas. We see more and more countries that are establishing targets, climate neutrality targets, 2050 for the EU, 2045 for Germany and Sweden, 2035 for Finland, 2035 for the city of Munich. And we see the European Union investing in cities to be climate neutral and smart cities by 2030. And we see the same kind of developments now happening in China and in the United States. And that matters, because if we take China, the United States, and the European Union, we're pretty close to half of global CO2 emissions. Now let's bring a couple of other countries into the mix. What about India? What about South Africa? Here, too, we are starting to hear the voices of change. It's partly the developing countries saying, we need financial assistance, we need technological assistance to be able to compete in this new uh, reality and to address the impacts of climate change. It's also the potential for new partnerships, like the German partnership with South Africa that we're seeing. At the same time, 
we are starting to see even regions like the Middle East. You may know that the next conference of the parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change is to take place in the United Arab Emirates, in the city of Dubai. Dubai has considered itself a place of the future, a place to invest in the ideas of the future. And Dubai considers itself a smart city and a sustainable smart city. And they have been testing all kinds of amazing new uh, ways of becoming a city that has a low carbon footprint and that is into the new technologies of the future. And as the host to the next conference of the parties, where we have to consider what can we do to get our climate responses to be much more dynamic than they are today, because we're still really not doing enough. Dubai has said in its announcement for the conference, it's been seven years since the Paris Agreement. We have seven years until 2030, and by then, we should have reduced global CO2 emissions by 45% of their current levels. 45% of their current levels. What does that mean? It means that we all need to do much more, but we can do much more. And what we need to do is believe in that narrative, that narrative that climate change is not just a threat, but climate change is an opportunity, an opportunity to take the creativity of all of your minds, the opportunity for us to work together as a global community and to say, we can do it. We can do it and we can in that process make a world that is a whole lot nicer than the current world. Cleaner air, a better use of resources, far more social justice, far more appreciation of the nature that's around us. So all I can say to all of you is pick up the baton, run with it, and let's do it together. Thank you.